Jack was a 42-year-old fishing boat captain who had been working on the waters off the Florida Keys for his entire adult life. He was born and raised in Big Pine Key and started going out on fishing charters with his dad as a teenage boy before getting his own modest boat several years later. Jack knew the local waters like the back of his hand, where to find the best fishing spots for every season, how to read the currents and winds, all the hiding places for gators and aquatic life. He'd pretty much seen it all after spending half his life out on the ocean and flats near his small island home, or at least he thought he had, until the day he encountered something he couldn't begin to understand or explain. So listen in as Jack tells us his story. I was out on my boat fishing about 20 miles off the coast of the Florida Keys. It was a pretty regular day, warm and sunny with a light breeze. I had already caught a few nice-sized yellowtail snappers and was getting ready to head back in around 3 p.m. That's when I noticed something odd breaking the surface in the distance. At first, I just thought it was maybe a big sea turtle or a shark breaking the surface of the water. Interesting, but a bit nerve-wracking to think it might be a shark. But as I looked closer, I realized this thing was way too big and moving really strangely, kind of rolling and undulating through the waves instead of swimming normally. From the movements, it looked to be really long. I quickly grabbed my binoculars to get a better look. As it got closer, I could make out more and more of the bizarre details. This thing had a long, thick, serpent-like body, easily 30 to 40 feet from head to tail. Its skin was a grayish green color, and it had these weirdly frilled extensions running all along its arched back, kind of like a sail on the back of a dinosaur. Its head looked almost horse-like, with a long curved snout, flaring nostrils, and floppy pointed ears laid back against its skull. The jaws didn't open very wide, but I could see multiple rows of teeth lining them. Its eyes were set a little further back from the snout, and were small but incredibly intense, with bright yellow streaks through the pupils. But the absolute weirdest part was these feathery appendages sticking out every four or five feet along the creature's sides. They almost looked like frilly wings or fins, undulating and flexing as it moved through the water. Sometimes they'd stretch out nearly 10 feet wide before folding back against its body. I'd never seen anything even remotely like that on any marine animal. For a few minutes, I just sat there in my boat, watching this bizarrely prehistoric-looking thing, seamlessly gliding through the waves only a couple hundred yards away. It didn't seem to be heading straight towards me or anything. Part of me wondered if I was just hallucinating from too much sun. Suddenly, the creature arched its long neck up and let out this haunting, bellowing wail, like nothing I've ever heard before. It seriously gave me chills. The best I can describe it is a low, pulsing moan that rose up into this piercing shriek before dropping off again into a deep rumble. It was so unearthly and just plain wrong sounding. After that cry, the thing took a massive breath, filling what I can only assume were its lungs rather than gills. Then it abruptly turned and dove straight down, disappearing under the waves without a trace. I waited around another 15 to 20 minutes scanning the area with my binoculars, but there was no sign of it at all, above or below water. By that point, the sun was getting pretty low, so I booked it back to the marina near Big Pine Key, my mind just spinning the whole way about what the hell I possibly could have seen out there. When I got back, I immediately started asking around the other fishermen and boat captains, trying to figure out if anyone else had spotted this monster-like creature with the weird feathery appendages and prehistoric look. But to be honest, I didn't say those words thinking they sounded too weird. I just asked if anyone had seen something strange. But no one else had seen anything out of the ordinary that day. Most just moved along and didn't give me more than a one-word answer, no. A couple of the more experienced old salts answered me with, yeah, the ocean's full of things we haven't discovered yet. But I really wondered if they personally encountered anything as bizarre as what I was describing. A half snake half dinosaur with that strange flare on its back. I spent weeks scouring the internet and library, looking for any potential records of similar sightings of unknown marine creatures in that region of the Florida Keys and surrounding Gulf waters. 
there were a handful of accounts that shared some characteristics, talking about elongated serpent-like bodies, weird frill appendages, haunting noises, but nothing quite matched the absolutely otherworldly, massive creature covered in those feathery wings or fins that I witnessed bobbing on the waves that afternoon. To this day, over a year later, I still can't fully explain what I saw out there or make any real sense of it. Part of me wonders if it was some prehistoric reptile that somehow evolved and survived in the depths of the ocean this whole time. I mean, I'm one to know that the ocean is something not to take lightly. Anyway, I guess I'll just have to continue wondering. It's easy to tell when someone's exaggerating, isn't it? And it's easy to tell when a story is just being a little embellished. Everyone wants to look good when talking about themselves, right? So people kind of naturally reshape things. We make ourselves look more capable or more in the know than we really are. It isn't wrong or right exactly, it's just the way things are. When a story makes somebody look bad though, when it makes them look weak or foolish, that's usually a story you can trust. When they have to be just a little bit embarrassed or a little bit vulnerable, that's when you can be pretty sure they're being honest. That's how I knew I could trust this next story from Carol Ann. Carol was walking home one night. It was the middle of the California summer, sometime in the early 80s, before the Night Stalker shut all the young people indoors, you know? East Avenue was uncharacteristically quiet that night, even if most of Carol Ann's peers were preoccupied by the nearby high school's football game. When a strange light passed through the sky, Carol might have been the only person in town looking up. It was odd, she thought. Streaks of red and blue and yellow, spinning or rotating as it passed. It must have been a helicopter or a plane, something approaching the airport either way. She shook her head and chose to move on with her night. But the lights weren't done with Carol Ann. It was another 15 minutes east before she'd be home. The duration of her walk didn't usually bother her, but tonight she was feeling every inch of the journey. She was uncharacteristically fatigued, sedated almost. Her body was telling her to sit down, lay down, anything to relax. But she couldn't just stop in the middle of the street. The sidewalk wouldn't make a great bed either. She kept going. When the lights came back, she was too weak to run. There was a sudden blinding light from overhead. It was yellow, then green, then blue. It fell down on her like a beam. It fell like water. It had a weight to it washing over her and pushing her down. Or was that just the exhaustion? She tried to keep moving. She tried to reach forward, convinced that if she could just get a hand outside of the light's reach, she'd be able to move freely again. But Carol was too weak. Something was draining her. She was empty. And then she was asleep. Then she was cold. Carol's eyes fluttered open and the light was gone. There was a glow now, pulsating like an amber wave but it was more like the light of a fireplace than a flashlight. It was strangely comfortable. She couldn't turn her head to see the source. She tried, but something was holding her down. Cold metal. Cold metal was wrapped around her neck and her forehead, her wrists and her ankles. She struggled and squirmed, but it made no difference. She was trapped. Worst of all was the fear. Normally it would make her stronger. It would make her faster. In the very least, it would make her scream. But Carol still couldn't move. She couldn't muster the strength necessary to part her lips and yell for help. She had to swallow that fear. She had to let it fester inside of her, spreading like a weed through a garden. The room faded in and out of her vision. She thought it was the light at first, extinguishing and relighting. But Carol Ann soon realized that it was in fact her consciousness. When it returned a few cycles later, there was something else in her line of sight. A man with a lizard's head, not scaled but smooth, wide mouth. Large black eyes sat on either side of his head. Carol was reminded of a gecko or a salamander, but the anatomy of the body didn't match. Upright, first of all. Looking at it standing there, looming, made her stomach turn. Long arms that bent at odd angles, a hunched back, like the spine was hook-shaped. She could taste the bile and acid in her mouth. The creature, the man or whatever it was, lurched forward, reached for her. She slipped out of consciousness again, 
Was it all a dream? She hoped so. Visions of that creature haunted her, appearing repeatedly with the same fiery light behind it. The room seemed to breathe around her. She prayed for it to stop. If it was a dream, she prayed that it would end and she'd find herself buried underneath her blankets. When Carol Ann woke, she was in her backyard. The sun was up. Her mother was yelling her name and running toward her. The high school had played their game on a Friday. Carol Ann's mother was dressed for the Sunday service. She was scolded, then embraced. She was helped to her room and then grounded to it. Carol got a reputation for her missing weekend. All kinds of stories were invented for her. She'd gone partying. She'd tried to run away but got cold feet. None of those stories were as frightening or as embarrassing as the story that Carol Ann herself told. Goosebumps crossed her forearms when she mentioned the light. She shuddered and bit her lip when she described her captor. More than once, she told the story through tears. Her medical records, she swore, would prove what happened. She went to the hospital the week she got back, exhausted, dehydrated, starved. The doctors claimed that she must not have eaten all week. It was the only thing that explained the severity of her condition. And although her mother knew that wasn't true, entertaining Carol Ann's story was too frightening to consider. But why would she tell a story that made herself appear so weak? Why would she admit to being captured by something, examined by something, if it wasn't to warn people that it might happen to them too? Not everyone is afraid of the same things. There are a few fears though that everyone understands. Being afraid of these things just makes sense. Heights, water, snakes, and spiders. Maybe everyone isn't afraid of them, but everyone understands. No one wants to fall. No one wants to drown. And no one wants to get bitten by something that crawls or slithers. Edgar was scared of water. It was a little embarrassing for a firefighter to be afraid of the very thing he used to extinguish house fires. But in Edgar's case, it couldn't be helped. The hose didn't bother him, obviously. A sink or a bucket full of water wasn't a problem. He could endure a shower just fine. But a body of water, a pond or a lake, or worst of all, the sea, that would make Edgar sweat more than any flame. It hadn't always been that way, or so Edgar claimed. Sometime right after he completed his training, Edgar took a seaside vacation. South Carolina wasn't far from his home state, and the Atlantic Ocean was calling his name. It felt like a suitable reward after the work he did to get into shape, to study the science of fire, and to learn how to care for anyone rescued from an inferno. The sun, the sand, and the sea. Edgar said he was looking forward to all three. When it was time to enjoy that third one, though, he found peril instead of paradise. Or maybe peril forced itself upon him. The ocean has a funny way of enforcing its will, doesn't it? Maybe Edgar just found himself on Mother Nature's bad side. It was late at night. He left his friends and other members of his graduating class back at the casino. He wanted one more stroll along the beach. It was good for his head, or something like that. He was going through a breakup at the time, and the quietude of the beach at midnight was all the self-care Edgar needed to survive. He watched the moon dance on the surface of the water. He watched the tide kiss the sand and retreat back into the sea, teasing the shore like they were old friends. He counted his footprints. He let the water climb up to his knees and let the timid waves brush through his fingertips. Then he heard her calling, a woman's voice not far to his right, a little further out in the water. He looked up and saw her, shoulders above the surface, hair plastered to her head and neck. Her smile was bright, even in the darkness. It caught the moonlight just like the sea itself. He liked that smile. He liked her wide eyes. He called back to her and waved. He knew she was speaking, but he couldn't understand the words. A foreign language, maybe. Something from across the pond. Either way, he liked the sound of it. She sounded friendly. She looked friendly, too. He felt himself being pulled toward her, nudged as if by the current itself. Edgar could fight the whirs and whistles of the slot machines, but he couldn't fight her call. He moved slowly in her direction still trying to strike a measure of conversation that he could understand. One step closer, then another. For some reason, 
He believed that if he just got close enough that he might be able to understand. It felt as though the distance between them was the only thing obscuring her words, and she was reaching toward him, delicate, slender fingers. Soft fingers, he imagined. He wanted to feel them, held in between his hands. Then he slipped. For a moment, his head bobbed under the water. He saw scales. He saw a tail in the distance, swaying in the place where legs should have been. He emerged again and choked, yelled. He spat and doubled backward, wiping the water from his eyes. She was still there, still standing. He squinted to see her better, to make out more features than just the shine of her smile and the eagerness of her gaze. They had been enough to disarm him. They had been enough to call him closer. But now that he was looking, everything was wrong. Her ears were flat against her skull. Small ridges lined her neck. And in the center of her eyes, he hated himself for not seeing it sooner. Her pupils were all wrong. They were static. They weren't adjusting in the dark. Not when they focused on him or when they flickered to the shoreline. It was small, but it was significant. A feature that he otherwise wouldn't have noticed in anyone else. Why did they look so lifeless? His friend called to him from the boardwalk. Edgar turned his head, heard a splash, and then looked back for the woman. She was gone. The water rippled. He felt five distinguished fingers brush across his calf, and he knew at once that she was under him. She was down there, in the water. She was toying with him. She could grab him if he wanted to. He turned to run, to half flail and half swim back to solid ground. She didn't grab him. She didn't pull him below the water or take him out to sea. She wanted him to come willingly, I guess. Tricking him must have been the fun part. He reached the sand, was hoisted up into the arms of his friend, and he turned again to face the ocean. Nothing. She still wasn't there. No one else had seen the woman. No one could validate Edgar's story. But now, when he looks at the surface of the water, he expects her to be looking back. One day, that smile will be waiting for him. And when that time comes around again, maybe he won't be as strong as he was before. Maybe next time he'll take her hand. Maybe next time he'll follow her out to sea. It was a warm Saturday morning in early June when Derek was out in his backyard clearing away some brush and overgrown bushes. His property in Perry County, Ohio, backs up to a small patch of woods, maybe five or six acres, nothing too big, but he said there were enough trees and undergrowth for all kinds of critters to make their home back there. His story is one that will keep you looking over your shoulder if you ever find yourself in rural Ohio. So, I had been out there working for a couple hours already, just chugging away with my handheld saw, getting a decent sweat going. I was in the middle of sawing through this one thick branch, when suddenly there was this extremely loud snapping sound that seemed to come from the tree line over by the woods. It made me jump and I stopped sawing right away. I stood there silent for a minute, listening to see if I could hear anything else. At first, I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, just typical forest sounds, some birds chirping, a few squirrels skittering around. But then I saw movement through the trees, about 40 or 50 feet into the woods. Something was moving between the trunks and bushes, and it didn't look like a small animal. At first, I thought maybe it was a deer, since we get those passing through the area pretty regularly, especially in the early morning and evening hours. But as I watched it more closely, I realized this was definitely not a deer. First of all, it was much bigger than any deer I've ever seen around here. If I had to put a size estimate on it, I'd say it was easily seven feet tall, maybe even eight feet. And it was walking upright on two legs like a person, not on four legs like a deer. The body seemed extremely thick and bulky, with this grayish colored fur covering its entire frame from head to toe. The arms were long and looked very muscular, with the hands hanging down close to the knees. As it turned its head from side to side, I could make out some pointed ears sticking up through the fur on top. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Looking at this thing moving slowly through the woods in an upright stance, my mind was racing a million miles a minute, trying to make some sort of rational sense of what I was witnessing. Maybe it was some sort of escaped exotic pet. 
But the more I studied its movements and size and body shape, the more I knew that none of those could possibly be the explanation. This was something else entirely, something I couldn't begin to rationalize or understand. The creature must have sensed me watching it or caught movement out of the corner of its eye because it suddenly stopped in its tracks and turned its head directly towards me. That's when I got my first good look at its face from the side profile. It looked flat and elongated, with a pronounced snout or muzzle area, rather than a typical rounded human-looking head and face. And the eyes were rounded and seemed to glow this intense, radiant orange color, unlike anything I've ever seen in nature before. We just stayed like that for about 10 or 15 seconds, me and this creature locking eyes with each other, neither of us moving a single muscle. It felt like time had stopped entirely in that moment. I couldn't breathe. I was so transfixed by whatever the hell I was looking at. Then, without any warning whatsoever, the thing suddenly opened its giant mouth and let out this roar that I can only describe as utterly deafening and bone chilling. The sound made my entire body seize up and every hair on my arms and neck stand straight up. It was so powerful and loud that I could feel it vibrating in my chest. The roar seemed to shake the trees around the creature, causing leaves and debris to rain down. I had never heard anything like it in my life. Still can't get that sound out of my head as a matter of fact. Before I could even try to respond or figure out what to do next, the creature whipped its head back forward and took off bolting in the other direction, moving at this incredible speed despite its massive size. Within a couple of seconds, it had disappeared entirely into the thick trees and brush, leaving me just standing there in total shock and confusion. I'm not sure how long I stayed after it ran off, but it was a while. My mind was just racing. I had so many unanswered questions and no rational explanations that could satisfy what I know I saw that day. I've lived in this area my whole life and have spent a ton of time exploring those woods over the years. Never once did I ever see evidence of anything like that. Hell, I always thought the idea of Bigfoot or werewolf type creatures was pretty silly and far-fetched, but now I don't know what to think anymore. All I know is what I saw with my own eyes, and it has left me scared, baffled, full of unanswered questions. I haven't gone back in those woods since, telling myself I just don't want to risk another encounter, and I'm honestly not sure if I'll ever go back there again. Whatever that thing was, I have no interest in seeing it again. That's for damn sure. Part of me has wondered if I should report what I saw to someone. Police or wildlife experts or whoever might be able to look into this in a credible way. But then I think about how insane it would sound to describe what I witnessed and how nobody would ever believe me unless they saw it for themselves too. For now, I've decided to just keep this to myself and hope that I never cross paths with that being ever again as long as I live. Even in the hottest weather, chills can run down your spine. It's the body's warning system. It's intuition's way of letting us know that something's not right. Maybe we're even in danger. Those moments when you feel the air grow cold, your skin crawls. Those are the moments we need to pay attention to the most. Those moments are when we know to run. George's story is all about running. It's all about the signs he ignored and how dangerous things became when he failed to act. His story is a story about being hunted by something horrifying. George grew up with stories of strange things living in the desert. Goblins, alien men, and blood-sucking dogs. They were characters of his childhood. Stories told to him just like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. When George, many years removed from believing in characters like that, heard that one of those creatures had been spotted in real life, not far from his home. Well, who wouldn't want to check it out? One of his neighbors had seen it at a distance, a dog wandering between the rocks and brush of the desert, something mutated, gnarled, and calloused by the heat and the wind. George would have dismissed it as a wild dog if his neighbor hadn't described its back. They talked about spikes jutting from its spine, long barbs as sharp as nails and as dense as any creature's fur might have been. Maybe, George thought, his neighbor had seen the chupacabra. 
It didn't take much more than a long weekend and a few stiff drinks to convince George to go looking for it. Part of him knew what he was really expecting. Two relaxing nights under the stars. He was eager to use the monster hunt as an excuse to go camping. Under normal circumstances, he would have talked himself out of it. He would have said there was too much work to do. He would have spent the weekend on his couch, watching TV and complaining about all the time he was wasting. Turning the weekend into a rare occasion, into a once-in-a-lifetime event, was just the motivation George needed. Before the first sundown, however, George realized that he was in over his head. He picked a spot, said that he'd wait there to stake out the beast, and within an hour realized that he wasn't alone. Was this thing in the desert looking for him too? Had he just gotten lucky, or unlucky, and stumbled into its path? He felt it watching him long before he saw it. He felt its gaze from somewhere among the hills, crawling across his back. But he couldn't see it, not yet. So he stayed the course, ignored the first sign. Then George heard it. He heard the howl. He heard the rocks shift and slide in the distance, saw them skipping down the hillside, knocked loose by something he couldn't quite see. Another coincidence, he thought. He continued setting up camp, laughed for getting into his own head. Even as the sound of those rocks skipping across the terrain sent ripples of cold chills down his neck, George ignored them. He'd spent so long convincing himself of the impossible that he forgot to ask. What if? The creature answered for him. The next sound was a shriek. Something screamed from the mountains. It was the same something that was soon running in George's direction. It was tearing across the ground, low and on all fours. It was a fox. It was a mountain lion, maybe. As terrible as that would have been, at least George knew what a mountain lion was. He could deal with that. He could survive that. But something unfathomable, something he didn't believe in. What was a man supposed to do with that? Each spine on the creature's back glistened in the sunlight. They jumped along the ridge of the canine's spinal column, jolting with the beast's every step. It was massive. Its shoulders were as wide as George's own. Its body was long and powerful. He could see the muscles rippling and flexing beneath the skin. He could see its claws, scraping the earth and cutting scars into the stone and the dirt. That would be his skin. Except his would yawn open with ease. He'd be soft and weak in that thing's reach. So he had to stay out of that reach. George ran. He ran and cried and wailed. He threw everything he could between himself and the creature. Anything to slow it down. It didn't stop for the tent he toppled over. It didn't stop for the chair he threw aside. It didn't stop for the cooler or the cans that spilled across the desert when the lid burst open and the ice poured out. But George's fear made him fast. Just when he could feel the creature's breath on his neck, he dove into his car and shut the door behind him. He heard it crash against the metal and the glass, but he didn't look back at it. He cowered in his front seats. He heard it try once, twice, and three times to force its way in. He prayed for the glass to hold up. He prayed that the metal wouldn't whine and tear. He could imagine the monster being strong enough to rip it, but it wasn't. It left. It left George crying in his car, regretting that he'd left his keys at the campsite. He waited there for as long as he could, not daring to exit the vehicle. What if the monster was waiting? What if it was hiding underneath or overhead? He could wait, at least for a while. Eventually, he had no choice. And hours later, he sprinted back to the camp he abandoned, grabbed his keys from the dirt and ran from the desert. He was done chasing monsters and he was done ignoring the signs when they came. It doesn't take more than a single bad feeling to send George running. Being a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains is a pretty sweet gig most of the time. I get to spend every day out in nature, keeping an eye on things and helping folks explore these beautiful old forests and trails. After 12 years on the job, I've gotten to know this place pretty well. Most nights I'll hop on the quieter trails after dark to make my rounds, using my flashlight to look for any campers breaking regulations or critters causing trouble. The woods can seem pretty spooky at night, but I've never really been a skittish guy. I know what sounds and movements to expect from all the typical wildlife. 
Last month though, I came across something that shook me up more than anything else in my 12 years. It was around 11 p.m. on a cool October night, when I headed up one of the remote trails leading towards the top of Klingman's Dome, the highest peak around. I've been hauling up that trail hundreds of times over the years, but this time, something seemed really off. Not long into my hike, my flashlight beam settled on a massive clump of thick, matted brown fur lying on the trail. It was obviously animal fur, but nothing around here should have been shedding that much at once. I gave it a poke with my boot, puzzled, and spotted more globs of the same nasty fur further up ahead. As I followed the trail of fur, my unease grew when I noticed large footprints pressed deep into the dirt, definitely not bear tracks. These seemed broadly foot-shaped, but absolutely massive, each one easily 16 to 18 inches long and leaving a deep imprint. At first, I wondered if someone could be punking me by making fake Sasquatch tracks, but these seemed way too clear and defined, not to mention the size. I followed the huge sunken footprints for around 100 yards, my nerves rattling a bit more with every step when I stopped dead as I came around a bend, there crouched down by the creek and shoveling water into its mouth with its hands was the most unbelievable sight. Some sort of monstrous, hair-covered beast hunched on two big, muscular legs, easily seven or eight feet tall. It looked vaguely human-shaped, but completely covered in coarse, brownish hair. Its arms hung down practically to the ground and seemed longer and thicker than any man's. My mind couldn't make sense of this hulking, ape-like creature at first. It was slurping loudly from the creek, seemingly unaware of me. And in that moment, I was too stunned and confused to react. Was this some sort of joke or prank? But by who and how in this remote patch of wilderness? The more I studied it, the more real and solid it seemed. After about a minute, the beast suddenly froze mid-slurp, eerily still, like it had sensed my presence. In that tense silence with my heart pounding, I slowly braced for the creature to turn and charge. That's when a deafening crunch boomed from somewhere close behind me, like a truck smashing through trees. I spun around, and that's when I saw another one of those massive hair-covered beasts crashing through the trees towards me. This one was even bigger than the first, easily nine feet tall, with thick muscular arms that hung past its knees. It was moving incredibly fast, barreling right at me on two legs, snapping trees like twigs as it charged. Without even thinking, I screamed as loud as I possibly could. The thundering beast didn't even slow down. I turned to run, but massive arms wrapped around me from behind like steel cables. The first creature had me in its grip and began squeezing viciously. I strained against its chokehold, choking for air as I slammed my elbow back towards its face. A deafening roar exploded from the beast as I connected with something solid. Its grip loosened just enough for me to spin around and smack into its head with a broken tree branch. The monster reeled back, roaring in pain or maybe anger. As it staggered, I broke free and ran as fast as I could down the trail, gasping for air and firing blindly behind me. All I could hear were those earth-shaking roars echoing through the trees as I sprinted recklessly over rocks and roots, fleeing deeper into the dark forest. After what felt like miles, I finally outran whatever pursued me and collapsed in a heap by the trail. My hands were trembling as I stared back into the pitch darkness, wondering if those beasts would emerge again. But the woods were deathly silent apart from my ragged breathing. I have no idea what the hell I encountered out there. Nothing about those creatures seemed real or possible but I sure as hell saw them with my own two eyes. And those things were powerful and deadly. If not for dumb luck, I wouldn't be alive right now to try and get answers. I radioed into the station, my voice still shaky from the shock. A team of armed rangers came sweeping into those woods, but we never found a single shred of evidence. No footprints, no fur, no broken branches, nothing. It was like those massive beasts were figments of my imagination except I know what I saw, so that's why I'm posting here. Has anyone else in these parks or mountains ever encountered anything similar? Creatures that seemed part human, part ape, standing around eight to nine feet tall, massively strong and covered in fur, 
I know how crazy it sounds, but I need some goddamn answers after my horrific run-in. Please let me know if you've got any information, because I may be the park ranger around here, but I have no idea what I'm dealing with that is here and roaming in my woods. I've been a cop for 12 years, working the night shift in Indianapolis. I've seen some weird stuff in this city, but last Thursday night around 2 a.m., I had the shock of a lifetime. I was patrolling alone in my squad car, doing my normal rounds through a semi-industrial area on the west side. It was quiet, just the way I like it. Easy peasy. As I turned down Clark Street, something struck me as being out of place. A large, hunched-over figure skulking between the parked semi-trucks at the Indianapolis truck terminal. Now this area is supposed to be basically deserted at night, so I immediately got a bad feeling knowing someone was not playing by the rules. I slowed down to get a better look at whatever this thing was. That's when it turned towards the light from my headlights, and I audibly gasped when I saw it clearly. It was roughly seven feet tall, but hunched over in this unnatural, almost animal-like stance. It had extremely long arms that seemed to dangle almost to the ground. But the worst part was its face, if you can even call it that. It had these two huge, bulbous eyes, completely black like a shark and its mouth looked more like a gash or slit across its face, with no visible lips, teeth, or tongue. Just this black, cavernous opening. I'll admit I froze for a second out of pure shock and revulsion at this thing I was looking at. It tilted its head in this jerky, almost unnatural motion and let out a sort of high-pitched wheezing sound that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I should have called for backup right then. But my training and instincts just kicked in, and I threw the car into park and started to open my door to confront it. That's when the thing displayed a surprising amount of speed and agility for its size. It turned and bounded away, moving more like an animal than anything human, scrambling awkwardly but with incredible swiftness between the trucks and trailers. Again, instincts took over. I threw open my door and gave chase on foot pursuing the creature between the rows of parked semi-trucks. The thing was shockingly fast, bounding along in that hunched-over stance, its arms swinging wildly. I could barely keep it in my sights as it scrambled around corners and leapt up onto trailers with an unsettling, ape-like agility. A few times, I lost sight of it completely in the maze of trucks and darkness. Twice, it paused and turned back towards me those inky black pits it had for eyes seeming to bore right through me. Both times it let out that same ghastly, high-pitched wheezing that made my skin crawl. I'll never forget that unnatural, hellish sound. I chased the thing for what felt like miles, my breath becoming ragged and legs burning from exertion. Just when I thought I'd lost it for good, it would reappear up ahead, tantalizingly close, but still managing to expertly evade me at every turn. Finally, I turned a corner and saw the creature had stopped, perched atop a truck trailer. I drew my weapon, shouting at it to freeze and get down on the ground, but it just cocked its head at me, seeming to study me almost inquisitively with those soulless voids where eyes should be. That's when I heard a sound like nails on a chalkboard, raised to an ungodly volume that seemed to reverberate inside my skull. The creature's mouth was distending open in that black pit, far larger than should be possible. An unearthly, deafening screech unlike anything I've ever heard erupted from it. I stumbled backwards, covering my ears in a vain attempt to block out the demonic sounds assaulting my senses. In that moment of pure, mind-bending terror, the only thought that could penetrate my brain was that whatever this thing was, it was no creature of this earth. When the shriek finally ceased, I looked up to see the creature was gone, vanished without a trace. I was alone, shaking and drenched in a cold sweat, with no evidence remaining aside from my rattled psyche that anything had ever been there at all. After regaining my composure, I slowly looked around in a daze, half expecting the creature to reappear. But the truck yard was silent and still once more. With shaky hands, I trudged back to my squad car, replaying the nightmarish events over and over in my mind. I knew better than to even try explaining what had happened over the radio. 
I'd be laughed off the force. As I slumped into the driver's seat, I could still hear echoes of that unearthly shriek in my skull. My hands were trembling so violently that I had trouble getting the key in the ignition at first. I fired up the engine and pulled away, driving in a cold sweat in silence, my mind utterly consumed by what I had just witnessed. I knew one thing for certain, something unholy and inexplicable was lurking in the shadows of this city, and I feared I would never find a rational explanation or make sense of it, no matter how hard I tried. To this day, I have no rational explanation for what I saw and experienced that night. I put in for a transfer to day shift shortly after, because I knew that no matter how many years I spent patrolling the streets, I would never be prepared to encounter something like that again. Do you think I made the right choice? Sometimes you can tell something's dangerous just by its color. A snake with the wrong colored rings, for instance. The frog whose skin is a little too bright. Sometimes that color's jarring. It stands out. It wants to warn you away. Sometimes, however, that color isn't so easy to see. Sometimes that color wants to hide. It wants you to think it's normal, safe. Everything is exactly as it should be. But then the danger's on top of you. Mike's a hunter. By the book. State parks. Licenses. When Mike would hunt, he'd do it right. Often that meant being knee-deep in the thick of the woods. It meant masking his scent and using animal calls. Lures. It meant outsmarting whatever game he was after. On rare occasions, it meant being patient. It meant sitting in a deer blind for hours, even days. For Mike, letting the animal fall into his lap was just as satisfying as tracking it. It was early December, cold enough to kill. The blind was Mike's choice for the season, since it meant he could keep himself warm and off of the ground. Pack warmers and a portable heater meant he wouldn't be freezing when it came time to aim down the barrel of his gun. Until then, he was content watching the trees through the lenses of his binoculars. He watched a lot of small game come and go, creatures too trivial to point his rifle at, squirrels, birds. He saw a fox, admired it, and then watched it go its own way. Strangely enough, there wasn't a deer to be seen. In December, Mike was allowed to hunt either of the sexes, male or female, but not one had crossed his sights. Not one had appeared to even tempt him into firing. His gear was covered with field spray. His head and face were covered, even in his elevated position. He'd showered before coming to the woods. For all intents and purposes, Mike should have been invisible to the deer in the area. Why then would they be avoiding him? He was practically scratching his head raw when the first glimpse of an answer appeared in the park. A flash of white fur. It had to be a tail. Mike tried to find the rest of the deer among the foliage. It was camouflaged well. It had to be. It disappeared among the browns and the beiges. But if he was patient enough, and Mike knew that he was, he knew that the creature would reappear. It would move just right, triggering something as his field of vision. His eyes would snap to its location, and he'd be aiming at it soon enough. But the second appearance of that deer never came. Mike spotted something else instead. He saw the white fur moving yet again, still obscured by the branches and the leaves, and tried to track it from his post. It wasn't a tail. Too much surface area for that. He couldn't tell at first how big it was where the white started, and where the white came to an end. Then the realization dawned on him. It was too big to be a deer. If it was any type of beast that he'd encountered before, it was most certainly a bear. It would have been the biggest bear he'd ever seen, and an albino too, a white bear. Was it actually possible? The chance alone was enough to excite him. He didn't have the authority to shoot a bear, of course, but excuses and explanations were already running through his head. Regardless of what it meant for his morality, Mike wasn't going to let the opportunity pass him by. He prepared himself, held his breath. He was going to let the bear step into the clearing just beyond the blind, and then fate would take over. But it wasn't a bear that emerged. It was something else. There were horns on its head, long and curved, curling close to the creature's jaw and cheekbones. Its fur, unlike a bear's, 
was coarse and short, wool-like. Its maw, which sniffed the air even now, was punctuated by the pointed teeth which hung from its upper lip. It could have been a goat or a sheep of some kind, Mike thought at first, but its arms and legs ended in paws, wide and clawed, and again reminiscent of a bear. A horrible stench rode the wind. It climbed up to Mike's stand and filled the partially enclosed area with the stink of sulfur. It made his eyes water. It made his lungs burn. He wrapped his arm around his mouth and nose. He tried not to taste it. He tried not to cough, but he did. Once, muffled and through gritted teeth, was enough to betray his location. The creature slowly looked up. Its eyes with those rectangular-shaped pupils climbed to Mike's position and stopped there. It didn't roar or screech or turn tail and run. It watched him. Its breath was steady while Mike's was trembling. It seemed to dare him, raise the gun, point the rifle and pull the trigger. Mike's instincts as a hunter were screaming for him to do the same. Take the shot, take the trophy, but he couldn't. The gun was suddenly too heavy. The thought of firing at this thing that looked at him now with an impossible sense of intelligence. Even for Mike, it was too much. He watched the creature retreat, as casually as it had arrived, back into the woods. It wasn't much longer before Mike himself went home. He had his fill of hunting for the season. He might have mistaken the color at first. He might not have recognized the amount of danger that he was in when he first saw the flash of white. But he wasn't going to be foolish enough to push his luck. He might have held the weapon during that exchange, but he knew well and true that it was the monster who had all the power. I'm a firefighter up in Alaska, and I've seen some weird stuff in my time. Freaky animals, people acting crazy, you name it. But I can think of nothing else I've ever heard of that compares to the bizarre, terrifying encounter my crew and I had last summer. This is the kind of thing you'd never believe if you hadn't seen it with your own two eyes. It started out as a pretty routine call, a campfire that had spread out of control up in the back country outside of Anchorage, apparently just a couple college guys camping where they weren't supposed to be. We got the coordinates and headed out in the truck to take care of it. Should have been a simple job putting out the flames before they really took off. When we arrived on scene, we could barely see 10 feet in front of us, through the thick smoke billowing up from the burning dry brush and trees. The fire was blazing pretty intensely, whipped up by the winds. Me, Jenkins, Randall, and Lopez grabbed the hoses and heavy equipment and started hauling it towards the heart of the heat. That's when I first caught a glimpse of the thing. At first, I honestly thought it was just a burnt tree trunk or a big misshapen boulder through the distorting waves of heat and smoke. But then it started moving, very slowly and slightly at first, which is when I realized that it was alive. This huge, monstrous creature was pulling itself upright on two legs and beginning to lumber forwards. As the smoke swirled for a moment, I'll never forget the full picture that was revealed to me. This massive, hair-covered beast, easily eight or nine feet tall, was emerging from the flames and moving towards us. Its shoulders were immensely broad, with an extremely muscular, hunched frame, powerful legs that looked to have incredible strength. But the most shocking, bizarre thing was those arms. They were grossly long, dangling down almost to the thick, clawed feet, ending in gigantic fists and hands that could easily wrap around a person's body. The claws themselves must have been at least six inches curving downwards in daggers. I've never seen anything like it. This monstrosity looked vaguely like an ape, or some relative of Bigfoot, with the body shape of a gorilla, but elongated into an even more nightmarish form. Its face was the part that looked the most twisted and inhuman though, similar to a great ape, but with a massively protruding muzzle that seemed to protrude forward into powerful curved fangs at least as long as my fingers. No lips, just grotesquely huge teeth framing the gnarled snout. And I'll never be able to escape the image of those eyes. They weren't like anything I've ever seen, not on any creature, purely black holes, no whites or irises at all, just twin abysses that seemed to draw in all light. At that moment, 
time itself seemed to hang suspended. Was I hallucinating? In a waking dream? This simply could not be real. A beast straight out of the prehistoric era was looking at me through the swirling smoke and heat waves of a modern day Alaskan wildfire. Then Jenkins shouted out, his voice dripping with sheer panic. What the hell is that thing? The unexpected outburst seemed to trance. Jenkins lifted his hose and opened fire, blasting streams of water directly into the creature's face. It threw its head back, bearing rows of curved dagger-like fangs, and let out a roar that shook me to my core. I'm not exaggerating. This blood-curdling bellow felt like it reached through my ears and reverberated within my very bones and organs. A raw expression of rage and hostility on a level that shouldn't be possible from any living creature. Jenkins was blasting it point blank with the hose, but the creature swung one of those extraordinarily long arms with horrifying quickness. Its massive clawed hand, each finger tipped with a curved talon as thick as a man's thumb, smashed against the nozzle with bone-shattering force. The heavy-duty metal end casing completely crumpled and was torn free sending the high-pressure stream of water spraying wildly in all directions. At this point, sheer terror overtook us all. We turned and ran, abandoning the trucks and gear, fleeing desperately on foot as the only thought was to put distance between us and that, that thing from the deepest pits of nightmare. Branches whipped our faces and rocks tore at our boots as we scrambled over the uneven terrain in sheer panic but falling was not an option with the monster right behind us. I risked a glance back and witnessed an image seared into my mind forever. That ungodly abomination was crashing through the underbrush, immense arms swinging wildly as it ran on two trunk-like legs, closing the distance at a terrifying speed. Its jaw was unhinged in a permanent roar, the smoke-stained fur covering its body matted with soil and brush as it tore through the forest. For a moment, I could have sworn it locked eyes with me. Then Randall slipped on a patch of uneven mud, falling hard with a cry of pain and terror. The creature's pace only quickened as it spotted the easy target. We finally reached the vehicles, wheezing and half-blinded with smoke stinging our eyes. I flung open the truck door and essentially threw myself and Jenkins inside. As Randall dragged himself towards us, Lopez leaned out and pulled him aboard with his last ounce of strength just as those razored talons swiped through the space where Randall's back had been a split second before. I gunned the accelerator and we tore off down the dirt path, that ungodly roar still ringing in our ears, none of us daring to look back. We didn't stop driving until we reached the main roadway miles later, the harsh reality sinking in. Some sort of ancient, monstrous relic of prehistory still existed in the Alaskan wilderness. When we returned to base, we were still white as sheets, eyes wide with lingering horror, trying to explain to the fire chief and forest rangers, demanding to know what could have caused our frenzied evacuation. How could we even begin to convey that nightmare given form that had emerged from the flames and smoke? They predictably thought we were either making it up or had a mass hallucination from the intense conditions. But no matter how unbelievable, how incomprehensible that beast is burned into my mind forever. We went back with a full team the next day, armed like we were deploying into wartime. And yes, much of the forest area showed scars of the wildfire, but any trace of the creature's presence was completely erased, like it was never there to begin with. And I'm not sure if that makes me feel safe or scared, worrying what happened to it and where it went. It was around 9 p.m., and I was doing the final rounds checking on the animal enclosures at the St. Augustine Wild Reserve in Florida before heading home. Most of the larger mammals like lions, tigers, and bears were settled in their night quarters. I still needed to make sure the smaller animal areas were secure. As I approached the section with the raccoon and opossum enclosures, I noticed the raccoons were going absolutely nuts. They were frantically pacing, making a huge commotion with loud shrieking noises I'd never heard from them before. The opossum seemed undisturbed, just lying there like usual. I shone my flashlight into the raccoon area, wondering if maybe a snake or something 
had gotten inside and spooked them. At first, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Then in the corner, my light landed on something. It was low to the ground, with a vaguely canine shape, but it definitely wasn't a dog or coyote. Its body seemed too lean and elongated, like it had been stretched out unnaturally. The head was shockingly large compared to the body, with flat features and two small beady eyes that reflected the light. It didn't even seem to have a distinct muzzle or snout, just a big bulbous head that tapered down into an emaciated frame. The weirdest part was the way it moved. It didn't walk or run like a normal animal. It sort of oozed and squirmed along in an unsettling fluid motion, undulating side to side even though it clearly had legs and feet. Every part of it looked boneless and malleable, constantly shifting shapes. I was dumbstruck just staring at this otherworldly thing slithering through the raccoon area. The raccoons were berserk, climbing the walls desperately trying to get away from it, yet it didn't seem interested in them at all. It was just calmly making its way across the enclosure in that bizarre pulsating gait. Then the creature slowly swiveled its head toward me and fixed me with its black lifeless eyes. In that moment, I felt a pervading sense of dread and revulsion wash over me. Some primal part of my brain was screaming that this creature should not exist in nature. I felt violated just laying eyes on it, like I'd witnessed something I shouldn't have seen. We stayed like that the creature holding my stare. I couldn't look away from those depthless, unblinking eyes. My hands began shaking uncontrollably, and I nearly dropped the flashlight. After what felt like an eternity, but was probably only 30 seconds or so, the creature's head lolled lazily to the side, as if dismissing me. With one sinuous contraction of its body, it sprang up and cleanly vaulted over the 10-foot-tall enclosure fence and disappeared into the trees beyond. I just stood there shaken, barely able to process what I'd seen. Soon, other zoo workers came running over after hearing the raccoon's commotion. I tried explaining to them, but the words could barely get out. How do you even begin describing something like that? The other zoo workers looked skeptical as I tried explaining what I'd witnessed in the raccoon enclosure. I could understand their disbelief. It sounded crazy even to my own ears a shape-shifting creature that seemed to defy biology and physics. I probably would have thought I was making it up if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. We thoroughly searched the area with flashlights and couldn't find any trace of the abnormal entity. No footprints, fur, or other evidence that something had been there besides some bent branches high up, indicating it had vaulted over the fence just like I described. The raccoons eventually calmed down but seemed agitated and on edge the rest of the night. I gave an official report to my supervisor recounting the incident as accurately and matter-of-factly as possible. To their credit, they didn't dismiss it outright, even if some skepticism was apparent. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, though, and I had no proof beyond my own eyewitness account. Over the following nights, I stayed hyper-vigilant, desperately hoping for another glimpse of the creature if only to convince myself I hadn't just imagined the whole thing in a fit of fatigue or delusion. Part of me wanted a re-encounter to get better look, while another part of me dreaded the thought of laying eyes on that aberration again and feeling that soul-withering sense of existential wrongness. Weeks went by without any other sightings at the zoo. I tried scouring the internet for similar cases, but came up empty besides a handful of vague accounts. It seemed whatever I had crossed paths with that night was a unique phenomenon. Just when I'd resigned myself to never getting answers, a park ranger from a nature reserve two counties over contacted me after seeing my report. He claimed to have seen an identical creature skulking through the woods near one of his trails around the same time as my zoo sighting. His description matched mine in every eerie detail. We made plans to interview each other extensively and compare notes. Maybe there were others who had encountered this unidentified species before. Or perhaps it was something not from this world at all. I, over the following months, I interviewed the park ranger at length, and we contacted herpetologists, cryptozoologists, and other authorities to see if anyone could identify the strange, boneless creature we had encountered. While our descriptions matched precisely, no one had a definitive explanation for what we witnessed. 
The lack of additional physical evidence made it impossible to validate any hypotheses we came up with. In the end, all I was left with was a disquieting sense that I had glimpsed one of nature's true anomalies, something that didn't belong and seemed to operate outside our comprehension of biological norms. While the sighting shook me beyond belief, it also ignited an obsession to keep searching for others who may have seen this creature before and to hopefully one day gather enough data to unravel the mystery, even if some mysteries prove too unsettling for the truth to ever be accepted.